Welcome to the Creative Pen Podcast. I'm Joanna Penn, thriller author and creative entrepreneur, bringing you interviews, inspiration and information on writing, publishing options and marketing ideas for your book. You can find the episode show notes, your free author blueprint and lots more information at thecreativepen.com and that's pen with a double N. And here's the show. Hello creatives, I'm Joanna Penn and this is episode number 612 of the podcast and it is Friday the 18th of March 2022 as I record this. On today's show, I'm talking to Nikesh Shukla about Your Story Matters. Now, Nikesh is definitely A-list on the literary scene here in the UK, so it was great to talk to him about how he got into writing, as well as thoughts on finding your author voice, avoiding self-censorship, why writing Your Story Matters... And does social media actually sell any books? So that's coming up in the interview section. In publishing and book marketing news, well, an email came through this week, presumably to everyone on KDP, that Amazon has opened up ads to traditionally published authors. So you can now advertise traditionally published books along with your KDP titles in the US. So uh, you can do this through claiming the titles and pen names in Author Central. You click the books tab and then access the ads that way. I presume if you are registered, then you will have got the same email. So this is very interesting. And I read this announcement and I worry, (laughs) I worried immediately about all those lovely traditionally published authors who thought that publishers were going to deal with all the marketing. And now this kind of opens it up uh, for them too. Now, it's hard enough to make money as an indie author. (laughs) when uh, ad click costs are already high and the royalty rate for indies is obviously much higher per book than it is for traditionally published authors. So I cannot see how the business model would work for traditionally published authors who make less royalty per copy. So they would definitely be spending more per click than they get in profit. But I can see why people would do it. So first of all, the big names will do it, obviously, because they can sell massive bulk and they have massive cash. So expect more big name traditionally published authors and they probably won't do it themselves. Obviously, they'll pay someone to do it, but they can definitely do it now. And then there are those authors who want to prove to publishers that they can do well. And so they will be willing to put in money into advertising in order to influence sales and their next contract. Because if you earn out of a traditionally published contract and do well and exceed it in in massive ways, your next contract will be bigger. So I can I can see all kinds of traditionally published authors doing Amazon ads, even though it might not be profitable per click. Uh, again, like we've always said, Amazon ads work. Uh, can work well when you have a big backlist. So I certainly would expect some of the um, bigger names with a lot of backlist to go into this, but also, as I said, new authors. So if you're traditionally published, and again, this is in the US only right now, but I think this will, as usual, they roll things out in the US and then no doubt it will be in the UK and other territories. We can now advertise in like eight eight or more, I think, territories. So yeah, I would fully expect this to be rolled out. Interesting times, but I would expect ad click costs to rise even more uh, as this becomes a normal part of the industry in the next few months. But remember, the creator economy is not just about Amazon. And (laughs) that's so important to remember, and that I wanted to mention it again this week. I know I mention it all the time, but the indie author echo chamber... (laughs) focuses so much on the zone uh, that you'd think it was the only business model. And if you're a new author, you might not know that there are literally hundreds of other ways to make income streams from your books. Obviously, there are all the other stores and lots of different formats. And uh, there is direct sales, there's other products, there's all kinds of things. And my book, How to Make a Living with Your Writing, goes into this in detail. That's the third edition. 
And the Alliance of Independent Authors blog at Self Publishing Advice had a post recently on multiple streams of income. I mentioned it last week. I thought I'd mention it again (laughs) because this is so important and I'll link to it in the show notes. But it's called The Author's Ultimate Guide to Multiple Streams of Income. So I don't want people to be uh, worried or anything about these types of things because everything changes. Of course, everything changes. And if you think about Amazon as a business, their ad uh, platform makes a lot of revenue. <laughs> so of course, they're going to keep expanding it. It's, uh, it's a big earner. But we have to think about our businesses and what we want to spend our time on and how we're going to use things. Now, of course, I use Amazon ads. I'm not saying don't use them. I'm just saying think about all the other ways to make multiple streams of income. And of course, one of those streams is direct sales and crowdfunding. I wanted to give a little update on Brandon Sanderson's Kickstarter, which is now just under 30 million US (laughs) dollars. And in fact, next week, I have an interview with Monica Lionel all about Kickstarter for your book, which uh, we recorded about Uh, two days before Brandon launched. So our discussion doesn't cover Brandon's Kickstarter. But I think that's probably a good thing because at the moment it's skewing the thought about what Kickstarter is. Look, it's not just for the mega, mega big names, big best-selling authors. I'm considering a Kickstarter for my next non-fiction book, which will be How to Write a Novel, which is a working title. I don't know what it's going to be called, but it will probably be called that (laughs) with some kind of cool subtitle. But yeah, I'm considering a Kickstarter. And I wanted to mention and encourage you, if you would even consider it, if you want to consider Kickstarter, it is not just for those mega bestsellers. It can be super niche and small. So I wanted to mention a campaign by an author who shares my love of graveyards, cemeteries and ossuaries. If you've read any of my JF Penn books, you'll know how much I enjoy (laughs) that kind of cultural and architectural and uh, I guess philosophical heritage. So the author is Lauren Rhodes. And she's the author of 199 Cemeteries to See Before You Die, which is a total (laughs) must-have. If you enjoy that kind of books, uh, I was the first backer of her Kickstarter for a book of essays on why people like us love cemeteries. She had, so she put up the Kickstarter with a modest goal of a thousand US dollars. And she had lots of different levels from the ebook um, with black and white photos to the sort of a print book with black and white and then colour. And she had lots of, lots of different uh, levels, but a thousand dollars. It's not that big a goal if you even have a few people on your email list who might be interested in what you do. So if you are totally intimidated by Brandon Sanderson's (laughs) nearly 30 million, (laughs) then consider a thousand dollars for a book on, it's a book of essays on graveyards and cemeteries. And if you're a fellow fellow taffophile like us, Lauren came on my Books and Travel podcast episode and we geeked out on cemeteries and death culture. And her Kickstarter is Death's Garden Revisited, Relationships with Cemeteries. And I'll link to it in the show notes because I really want to support Lauren. And uh, I love books like this. I have a goal to write a book in that vein at some point in my career. (laughs) I have a lot of pictures of very cool cemeteries. So then in useful stuff, over to other types of marketing. Nick Stevenson is doing a free live webinar coming up on a step-by-step guide to go from zero to $1,000 per month in book sales. Or if you already make that, how can you better streamline and automate your sales? The free webinar is on Wednesday, the 30th of March, 2022 at 2 p.m. US Eastern, 7 p.m. UK. And of course, you can get the replay if you register. It includes the three steps to build a sustainable author career, traffic, conversions and scaling up, how to drive endless traffic to your books and websites without needing a huge ads budget, how to convert traffic into sales and email subscribers and how to automate your marketing systems, which we all need. And uh, I use Nick's process many years ago now and uh, it still is brilliant, still 
Uh, it's fantastic, useful content. And the webinar is free and you don't have to buy anything. You'll get lots of useful tips. Uh, if you do go on to buy Nick's premium course, your 10K readers, which is fantastic, I do receive a percentage of sale at no extra cost to you as I am an affiliate. I love Nick's training. I highly recommend it. So if you would like to attend the free webinar, go to thecreativepen.com forward slash Nick22, N-I-C-K-22, to sign up for that and links in the show notes. And also, as a final reminder, it's my birthday or it's been my birthday. I'm now 47 <laughs> and I've got a 50% off sale on my ebooks, audiobooks and courses, including the AI assisted author, which many of you are now taking, which I'm super encouraged about because when I put it out just before Christmas, it didn't get much love. <laughs> but now lots of you are trying it. So that's encouraging. Your author business plan is also included in the courses, my craft courses on fiction and nonfiction, productivity and more. You can use coupon MARCH22, all caps, at thecreativepen.com forward slash learn for the courses and payhip.com forward slash thecreativepen for my ebooks and audiobooks. So in my personal update, I'm in the hand edits for Ark of Blood, my third arcane thriller. So as I've mentioned, I'm rewriting the books that I wrote over 10 years ago. <laughs> I have done the ebook updates on Crypt of Bones, so the 2022 edition is out now on all the ebook platforms, and the print books are with my designer, so they'll be up in the next week or so. And I'm, I'm actually, I'm loving the re-editing process so much that I kind of want to continue through to books at least four and five, which are novellas, so it would be quicker. But I also want to get back to writing new things, so we shall see. I might have to balance the two. I'm also now a fledgling NFT artist, which is kind of hilarious, but also kind of a natural home for me as someone who writes very visual uh, sense of place type books. And as I explained, I explained the background of why that fits in the ep introduction of episode 610 this week. So if you haven't listened to that, I talk about it more in that first introduction. I have now, as I record this, I've minted three NFTs and all sold very quickly. Um, uh, the third one within a minute or two. <laughs> so thanks to those of you who are taking a chance, basically, and believing in my creative future enough to invest. There are more to come as I'm loving. I love, love, like I absolutely love it. And um, it makes me really happy to create these images around the words from my book and taking the photos of places that appear in my books and turning them into art. So it's making me feel much more confident about my creative future and where I might go over the next 15 years of my business. Um, I am, I guess I'm, uh, oh goodness, I guess I'm more than 15 years now since I started writing in 2006. Yes, yeah, so I love having multiple streams of creative income and this is just another one. I am already a multi-passionate creator, but I feel like my direction is certainly shifting. So yeah, exciting times. So thanks for all your emails and tweets and comments this week. Susan Florio on YouTube said she needed the interview with Dan on creativity. She said, I'm a new author, first book to be released this summer. I've been planning a long time. I have new ideas about genre and how to market myself. The show gave me the courage that even though my idea was different from everything I've heard, that doesn't mean it's bad. Fingers crossed and thanks for the inspiration. And thanks to Carol Westmore, who sent me a video <laughs> from the beach in South Africa, which was lovely here in my cold room. <laughs> uh, Carol said she enjoyed the show with Dharma on Writer's Block. And she also mentioned her summit, The Inner Game of Writing. So it was a, a classy way of both saying hi, sending me a video and a bit of marketing. So thanks, Carol. Dan left a comment on the show notes from my solo NFT episode saying, even at 81, I can get excited about the prospects for NFTs. I spent 40 years in IT and it was a constant process of adapting to change, embracing the new, adopting early, and as you pointed out, making a few mistakes. If I'm still around 10 years from now, I would like to look back and say I took advantage of this podcast and earlier ones you've posted on the topic. The signposts for change are writ large in bright neon, at least to those of us who are able to extrapolate from present conditions and see a direction they are likely to follow. Thanks so much for that comment, Dan, and it means so much to me that someone with your amount of experience can also see this change coming. So thank you so much. 
So, of course, you can tweet me at The Creative Pen, send me pictures of where you're listening, or email me, joanna at thecreativepen.com, or leave a comment on the show notes on the blog or the YouTube channel. I love to hear from you. It makes this more of a conversation. So today's show is sponsored by Ingram Spark and of course print sales are a completely different income stream. <laughs> it's a bit of a theme for today's show. So I use Ingram Spark to print and distribute my self-published print books wide because with Ingram Spark it's my content, but they help me do more with it. So why even consider Ingram Spark? Well, if you only use KDP Print, bookstores, libraries, universities and print-on-demand sites in lots of other international countries will not even consider your book because you need to offer a discount and you also need to be in their catalogues. Plus, a lot of these places would never order from Amazon for obvious reasons. So if you care about getting your books into these places, you need to go wide with your print books. And remember, this is not about exclusivity on KU, which is for ebooks. Even if you are exclusive with ebooks, you can do print wide with Ingram Spark. You will have access to over 40,000 retailers, independent bookstores, libraries, schools and universities, chain bookstores and more across a global network of distributors, uh, including Foils, Blackwells and Waterstones in the UK, Bookshop.org, Booktopia in Australia and New Zealand, Chapters Indigo in Canada, Walmart, Target and loads more independent stores in the USA. You can choose to use returns, but it's not necessary. And you can choose your discount percentage. You can also bulk order, which I do when I'm doing uh, speaking things. And in fact, I did order a ton over to New Zealand, but then I didn't do any speaking because of COVID. (laughs) But I will start to do more, of course, once again. And a couple of specific tips. You can get promo codes for Ingram Spark as part of many organisations and groups. For example, the Alliance of Independent Authors has a monthly code and also the 20 books to 50k Facebook group sometimes has them too. Plus, if you've been publishing with Ingram Spark for a while, it might be time to update your prices. I, I've been there for now, I think, about four years. And I recently went in because essentially we've had a combination of global supply chain issues, paper price rises and inflation. And none of these are stopping as an issue. And it means your margins are being eaten up. So I recently went in and literally I went into every single book and raised my prices on all of them because, uh, yeah, I still want to make money. (laughs) So what are you waiting for? It's your content. Do more with it. Head over to ingramspark.com. So this type of corporate sponsorship pays for the hosting, transcription and editing. But my time in creating this show is sponsored by my wonderful patrons. Thanks to new patrons this week. Dan Jacobson, Mark A. Pittman, Mario Tosto, Stephen Lyons, Alyssa Curon and Ron Vital. I really appreciate it. And several of you mentioned that you have joined the Patreon because of my focus on NFTs and blockchain and the future stuff and AI and all of that. So I really appreciate that because before Christmas, you'll probably remember I was feeling a little bit wobbly about this new direction, but now I'm sure of it. So you can support the show with a few dollars or euros or pounds. They do have a lot of currencies now and you will get the extra monthly Q&A audio, which I just put out. And uh, the Q&A I separate now into the craft, publishing, marketing and business questions. And then I'll keep the blockchain NFT AI questions um, separate. So you don't have to listen to those. (laughs) I know many of you just want the craft and business and publishing stuff. So you can have that too. You can support the show at patreon.com, p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com forward slash the creative pen. Right, let's get into the interview. Nikesh Shukla is a best-selling novelist, as well as a screenwriter, editor, podcaster, and essayist. He has been named one of Time Magazine's cultural leaders, Foreign Policy Magazine's 100 Global Thinkers, and he's a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature. His latest non-fiction book is Your Story Matters. Find your voice, sharpen your skills, tell your story. So welcome, Nikesh. Hello. Well, welcome to the show. But tell us a bit more about you and how you got into writing. I was quite a shy and awkward teenager and I didn't really like going out and doing all the sort of the miscreant deeds that teenagers do. And so I just sat in my room and listened to a lot of rap and a lot of comic. I read a lot of comics and 
I would transcribe all of the rap lyrics and I would read the comics again and again and again. And after a while, I started writing my own rap lyrics and writing out my own arcs for Spider-Man and for Batman. And so I guess it's like some sort of fan fiction-y type thing, route is what brought me into writing. And then from that, I, I graduated to what most uh, teenagers do, which is write appalling poetry. <laughs> <laughs> Woohoo! <laughs> so yeah, I, th- I think that's probably where it all started for me is just being a teenager, <laughs> being a shy teenager who like felt like I had a lot to say about the world and the world was against me, but I could write down how I felt about the world. Yeah. Well, obviously you're not a teenager anymore. So how did it go from a terrible teenage poetry into fellow of the Royal Society of Literature, <laughs> which to me is like, you know, obviously we're both British and I don't know if Americans will realise this. This is a really big deal. So how did you cross that gap? God, how, who knows? Like a series of un, of unfortunate events, probably. I don't know. Um, so yeah. Okay. So here's a thing that happened to me when I was a teenager that is sort of my origin story. I write about this in Your Story Matters. But at some point during my teenage years, I saw an advert for an international poetry competition. I think I was like 15 or 16. And you had to submit a poem and you could win a lot of money and go into an anthology. And I thought, I'm a sick poet. So I sent off a poem that was your very standard teenage fair a t- teenager goes for a walk, sp- spots nature, and the nature reminds him that we're all going to die someday. <laughs> <laughs> like really bad stuff. It was really bad. And I sent I sent that poem off. It was called Train of Thought or Trail of Thought. Trail of Thought. Get it? Because he, he was on a walk, a trail, and he was having thoughts. <laughs> and the thoughts were wandering. <laughs> um, and I, at some point, I got a letter back from the International Poetry Foundation or whoever it was saying, you haven't won the International Poetry Competition, but we love your poem and we're going to include it in our anthology, Awaken to a Dream. And I was like, oh my God, I'm going to be published. This is amazing. Yes, this is happening. I am going to, I'm on my journey now. And then it said, if you wish to be included in the anthology, then you have to buy a copy of the anthology, which costs £50, uh, but we will give you a discount of uh, uh, £5, so you just have to pay £45, and then you can be in the anthology, and we'll send you a copy. And I didn't realise what the listeners are probably realising right now. I was a teenager, and I was desperate to be published. Um, I was a prolific bad poet, after all. And so I begged my mum for the money. I saved up. I pulled together savings. I sold some comics and I scrimped and saved and I managed to scrimp together £45, got my mum to write a check, gave her the money. I think she knew what I think we're all going to, what we're all <laughs> expecting to happen. And I sent it off. And then about six months later, I got a big package through the post and it was Awaken to a Dream. Now, let me just describe Awaken to a Dream to you. It is A4 size. It is over 500 pages long. <laughs> the paper is very thin, you know, the type of paper you might line a cake tray with. And there are like between five and seven poems on each page. So there's a lot of <laughs> a lot of poems. made a lot of money out of that. <laughs> they made a lot of money out of that. You know, we were all paying 50 quid. We were all paying 45 <laughs> quid for that. I, I did the maths actually because I've, t- I've spoken. I've spoken about this before. I did the maths, and you, I, I imagine because it was very cheap, p- cheaply printed, and you were paying for package and posting. They would have cleared at least like two hundred fifty thousand pounds from that. But that's a very rough maths of uh, how many people, how many poems were in there. So, but th- th- I was devastated because I'd really sort of saved up as much as I could to get this poem in there, and the realization I had after that was that my words mattered and if they mattered, then I needed to make sure that they all always were published in a way that highlighted how much they mattered. So <laughs> that was my origin story. And so I kept writing. I was working on a book when I was at university called Darkie, 
it was sort of my attempt to tell my uncle's story because my uncle had did some amazing activism in the late sixties when he came to the UK and I wanted to write his story, but I, I, it was just a story. Like it wasn't characters. It was just like me recording the things that I knew about my uncle and, and not really knowing how to write a novel at 19. But anyway, I, uh, went to a concert by the band Asian Dub Foundation, who were my band at the time. I was obsessed with them. I, they were just the most amazing band in the whole world. And they were performing at the University of London Union. I longed to see them. And afterwards, I saw their lead singer, uh, a guy called Didar Zaman, just hanging out. And I went to talk to him, and he was just the most lovely guy. He was really interested in me, really like wanted to inspire young people, told me to send him what I had of the book, which I did later on that evening when I got home. <clears throat> he gave me his email address and I sent it to him and he was like, this is great. Do you want to meet up for a cup of tea? And I was like, oh my God, I'm meeting Dida Zaman from Asian Dub Foundation for a cup of tea. So I went to Green Street, uh, which was near where he lived at the time. And um, we sat and we drank t- uh, tea and we ate chard and we talked about writing and rap and he asked me to read him some of my poems. And so I did. And he was like, these sound like raps. And I was like, do they? And he was like, have you ever rapped before? I was like, no. So he said, okay, come with me. So he took me that day, he took me back to his house and he put some beats on and just taught me how to rap over an afternoon. And it was just the most inspiring moment of my life. And it was just the moment I stepped out of my shell. And after that, I spent my years, like my 20s, like trying to be a rapper. I wasn't very good, but I was sort of inspired by by him and by the space he gave me. And I was also writing short stories. And because I was really inspired by politics, I was using short stories to kind of talk about unsung heroes and I wrote this short story about this young boy called Zahid Mubarak. It is a very big story about the miscarriages of justice in the political system, in the prison system in the UK. And I wrote a short story about him and I sent it off to an anthology because I, at this point it was the mid noughties and I was doing a lot of spoken word stuff alongside the rap and alongside writing short stories. And I was surrounded by all these amazing poets like Inua Elams and Musa Okwonga, Selena Godin. Um, and there was this guy called Ni Aikwe Parks who was running all these amazing nights. And he was also working on anthologies. One of them was called Tell Tales and volume one had just come out. And it had like a, a short stories by amazing writers. And he was working on that with Corche Newland, who was a, like a hero of mine. I loved his novel, The Scholar. And they were then were taking submissions for volume two. And I just sent this short story about Zahid Mubarak in. They published it. And so actually the first time I was ever properly published was in a book edited by Rajiv Balasubramaniam and Korche Newland that Nee had, Nee Parks had put together. And the moment I realized that I was a writer, not a rapper, a, mu- uh, a novelist and a sh- fiction writer, not a m- musician in any way, was the moment I got that package through the post. Um, it came again, it came to my parents' house where I was living at the time. And this time it was book sized and mm. it had a barcode, which I was like, oh my God, I'm <laughs> automatically, this is legit. People can pay $9.99 in a shop and get this and I looked at the contents list uh, and I'd been paid for it as well I'd been paid like the most of money that I'd ever been paid for a single job in my entire life by that point um and I was paid to be in an anthology with Carmela Shamsi and Leonie Ross and Ramesh Gunasekara and Gemma Weeks and Gorge Newland my hero and that was the point at which everything changed I was like I need to do this now this is where my heart is at this is what I'm good at so that's how I became how I became a writer. I think what's great about what you've just talked about there is one how long things 
take. <laughs> but mm. two, you started by saying you were shy and awkward, and many of us here are introverts, and you know the, the people who did stay at home reading comics and books, and that's what we did and still do, in fact. But um, then you you stepped out and you met people and you met some of your heroes and you put your work out into the world, whether it was meeting that rapper for tea and then it, it, taking the opportunities as they come. And even though that first rip off um, vanity press <laughs> thing, that actually helped you. It helped push you into valuing your work, which is something that many people struggle with. So I love that, you know, it took it took that long and, and that you did all of that. But let's come to the book because the three parts, find your voice, sharpen your skills, tell your story. So let's start with find your voice, because again, this is a kind of a long term thing and many writers struggle with voice. So how do you define author voice and is it something we can easily find or do we just discover it over time? So this is a difficult thing. This is actually the thing that I don't think can really be taught in creative writing classes. I think I think creative writing classes can show you the way to develop your voice, but they can't teach you voice because it's so wrapped up in who you are as a person, as a writer, as with the interests you have, with the kind of the delivery and the execution that you want to attempt, with the view, the lens that you want to cast upon the world and the tone that you want to give to it. It's so unique to you. Like, I'm sure... There are listeners amongst us. I'll just give you a very live example of this. I think I know what my voice is, but then I read last year or the year before, whenever it came out, the last few years obviously feel like one long year to me. But uh, whenever I read Luster by Raven Leilani, I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. I need to write like Raven Leilani. Why don't I sound more like Raven Leilani? And I tried it. I tried to like write like her but I can't write like her because only she can write like her and also I write like myself and me writing my version of how Raven Lelani writes is just disingenuous and it's not who I am and it's, and it doesn't do what she does any justice either so I think we, voice is the unis of you basically it's the thing that makes your voice you and it's the, it's the thing that makes your story only the story that you could tell you know like we could all write a story about love but only i can tell this story in this way at this point in time and only you can tell that story that you want to tell at that moment in that way you know so like voice is so wrapped up in the way we tell stories and the, and the execution of the way we tell stories and actually the only real way to learn that about yourself is to write and write and write things that you're comfortable writing and write things that you're not comfortable writing write in ways that you feel comfortable writing and write in ways that you don't actually feel are your voice and just see what fits and just keep doing it and keep doing it and keep doing it and then it clicks you know my first novel is actually the third manuscript length thing that I wrote. And it was actually, <clears throat> as soon as I wrote it, I knew it was the one because it hit the tone that I'd wanted to have all along. And actually, before I started that novel, I had I had been given a book by Niven Givin, the um, very dear friend of mine and one of my mentors. He gave me Sag Harbour by Colson Whitehead, which is an amazing, amazing book. It's the, one of the funniest books. And I, I, I am a comedy writer at heart. I'm just a big studier of comedy. And that book gave me permission to write comedy. Uh, and I read it and it was so funny and so warm and so textured and just so rooted in who the characters were and it made me realize that the thing that I wanted to do was write comedy and so that novel just came out of me in a way that felt true to my voice because it sort of unlocked the fine the missing piece of my voice as it were so I do think there's a time element and there's a doing it a lot element and there's also a trusting yourself element as well because the other thing I think about creative writing classes and books about writing I know I've just written one (laughs) um, is that they tell you so much about structure and they may do it in a very matter of fact way or any accessible way like I've done or or they may even do it in a more esoteric way or a sort of slightly more highbrow way but the effect that they can sometimes have on writers is make them trust their instinct less and actually our instinct is ultimately all we have and so 
I always think that your instinct is the thing that's telling you what your voice is. So learn to trust your instinct. Yeah, I mean, I feel like I found my voice in like book five, uh, but then I didn't write as much poetry as you. <laughs> but um, I was thinking, you know, one of the issues I always had with those early books was a fear of judgment. And therefore I self-censored. I didn't. Uh, well, I had an instinct, but then I said, oh, I can't I lean into that instinct because what if people think X about me? So uh, what do you what would you say to people who might be struggling with fear of judgment or self-censorship? Yeah, God, if I knew the answer to this, <laughs> because I still struggle with that. I still struggle with that imposter syndrome. I still struggle with that inner critic. There's actually a section in Your Story Matters where I talk about how to work with alongside your inner critic, because I think often now our inner critic is a self-defense mechanism that we can listen to what it's trying to say rather than trying to fight against it. But I guess... <clears throat> I guess the main thing to say is rejection is part of the writing process because it's always a question. It's always a process of whittling it down to the one agent that can get it to the right editor who can get it to the right reader. And the thing is, once a book comes out, it doesn't belong to you anymore. It belongs to readers and you will find that readers will project all manner of things onto your work that you may not even, even have considered for example, I once got a one star, never read Goodreads reviews, by the way. But <laughs> no, don't go anywhere near it. <laughs> I once read a Goodreads review of one of my, of my third novel where I got one star because I didn't teach the reader enough about the British Empire. And I was <laughs> like, but it's a multi-generational family drama. Um, it's not about the British Empire. Maybe go and read a book by a historian. <laughs> um, mate, there are many out there. Brian Vother Gopal's got an amazing book about the British Empire. So knowing that readers bring themselves to their read, you know, readers don't read things objectively. We, we all project ourselves onto everything we read. So knowing all these things, I think it helps me to realise that actually the, the only thing that matters really for me is making sure that the thing that I'm writing is the best thing that I can make it and it matches what my intentions in writing are because there are so many other parts of the process that mean it doesn't belong to me after a certain point. So as long as I get it to, <clears throat> I get it to a position where it doesn't belong to me anymore and I'm happy to say goodbye to it, then that's, that to me feels like the best way to think about it. I also try and visualize the one reader who needs to read the, this this book rather than think about the many readers who could read this book i think about the one reader who needs it the most and focus on them yeah that's a good tip i like that and then you can also pretend they're really friendly and nice and we'll write you a good review <laughs> yeah but like yes and, you know, I, I spend so long telling other writers, don't read reviews, good good or bad, don't go on Amazon, don't check your sales ranking, don't ask your publisher for sales updates, don't, like, scour the various listicles and go, why am I not on this listicle? Because there's so much of it that you can't control. But the other thing is, I probably do all that <laughs> as well, <laughs> you know, because you can't help yourself, because there is a part of you that's just put a thing, a piece of your soul out into the world and you do want that external validation. But I, I think, I think for me, it's important to recognize what external validation is helpful and what external validation is unhelpful. And I guess at various parts of my career, I found myself, oh, what's a nice way to put this, uh, being the hate object of a lot of people because of my political views. Um, and I like once you've been through that kind of dragging on the internet, you realize that a lot of this stuff doesn't matter. All that matters is that moment when it's just you and the page and the silence of the room that you're writing in. And that moment where you read back on the thing that you've just written and you think, I've just articulated something that communes with the cosmos in some way. 
That's great. So I guess <laughs> moving on to the other parts of the book, you do talk about sharpening your skills. And so let's talk about how you plan a novel, because obviously some authors plot, other people discover, rewrite. Uh, and this is something that obviously is different between everyone. But how do you plan a novel and how does that shape your story? Look, I've written this book <laughs> and that doesn't mean I take my own advice, OK? <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, so I think each novel is very different because I think different novel, different book ideas come to you in different ways. There have been times where I've like planned, I've had a really great idea and I've planned it and planned it and planned it. And then the point at which I sit down to write it, it just doesn't match the plan anymore. And there have been times where I've just gone by the seat of my pants for that first draft and then I've got to the end and when I come to edit I'm like oh my god this is just too gargantuan a task I don't know if I love this enough to um put all that time in like I would say that for every novel that gets published there is like a full length manuscript that didn't make it because Mm. that's just how I write someone once said that a first draft is like shoveling sand into a sandbox that you will eventually make sculptures from and I really like that but just to add to that you know when you're in the shower or you're doing the washing up and this amazing idea comes to you, like this amazing idea, like your brain has entered buffering mode because you're just doing something that doesn't really require much thought and your mind wanders. Um, and by the time you get to your desk from the shower or from the washing up to record the amazing thought, you record it and it go, you then look back at it and it never matches that amazing thought that was in your head. That to me is the early drafts. It's that sort of slippage that occurs between thought and execution. And so much of the editing and the rewriting is about getting it closer to the head thought. And so I just, I I think giving yourself permission to spend a lot of time in the edit and also giving yourself permission to plan, but also adjust as you go because you want to give yourself the freedom to find new things as you write because as you get to know the characters more um you discover different things about them and if you don't give yourself that space then you can end up paralyzing yourself so i do think that so much of writing a novel is knowing what your intention is for the novel what your big question at the heart of the novel is but also planning and knowing the general direction um, but also allowing yourself to find new things as you go and also giving yourself time to edit so like in the mess of all of these things a novel emerges and I also really think that it's important when you're writing a novel to just basically I just think it's time I see so many writers every single week it seems spout the same thing about write a thousand words a day and I just think it's (laughs) nonsense to write to go you must write a thousand words a day if you're to be a writer but I would much rather spend an hour a day on a book because time for me is more important than volume I'd much rather have the time to write two great sentences than write a thousand words a day and on some days I can do that in 45 minutes and other days it's a real hard struggle and I'm just padding it out and then I've got that meeting coming up so I might as well just fill out the word count with nonsense that I know I'm gonna to have to delete in six months time when I come through the edit like what is the point of that so just spending time is the most helpful thing I think I agree on that thousand words a day I mean when I'm trying to get a first draft done I will you know, try and get those first draft words out. But then, like you say, you move, if you move into an edit process, then I'm not putting out a thousand words a day, but I tend to finish the draft and then go back and edit or cycle, cycle through. But your point is that everyone's different, right? And every book is different too. A hundred percent. Like we all, you know, like, right, this isn't school. So we're not like fighting against the very concept of mainstream institutional education. You've chosen to write a book. So you have to really think about the best way in which you work. Um, You also have to understand that there's like useful procrastinating and there's useless procrastinating and useful procrastinating is like getting into Google holes and doing research and reading stuff and all the rest of it. As long as you're doing that alongside your manuscript that is great then there's useless procrastinating which is like going oh I've got a great idea for a short story I'm going to work on something else 
but you know the best way that you work. So really think about that. Like I write best in the morning. So I try and do all of that stuff in the morning. I know that I work in 45 minute bursts. So I, I do that. And also every novel is different. You know, I, the novel I'm working on at the moment, which is not at the point where I really feel like I can talk about it in any useful way, but the novel I'm writing at the moment, I'm writing it slightly differently to how I've written previous things because it's so much more of an experiential novel uh, and a character study rather than like a plot driven thing. And so I just need to write it slower and spend more, t- more, fewer words. Ex- how do I explain? I, yeah, see, see, I can't even talk about it. <laughs> I'm just like in that precious part. I was going to say, try and say something like semi sensible about the writing of it, but actually, like, I'm just spending a lot more time being forensic about it because it's a, a novel about captured moments rather than a novel where this happens. It forces this person to make a choice. That choice has consequences. Then they, they have to make another choice and so on and so forth. Like this is much more, you know, it's a series of fragments and it needs to be treated as such. Mm. We'll keep an eye out for that in uh, in a few years time. <laughs> Uh, but the other part of the book, tell your story. And I think this is really interesting because you mentioned that you have a political stance, you have some issues that you have tackled in public. And I feel like your story, there's this fine line between wanting to communicate important truths about the world and society. And then there is delivering a story that readers love to be engaged with and and there's that that balance between preaching and storytelling so how do we tell this underlying important story while still telling a good story that readers love good question i think the way to do this is to remember that telling a story isn't about giving us the black and white of it no one wants to read an essay or a short story or a piece of fiction that is binary in any way that goes, this is right and this is wrong. This is good and this is bad. We're much more interested in the greys. We're much more interested in the complexity of life and the complexity of people. The way to the way I, I kind of talk about it in my classes is I'd say, those of us who have seen Avengers Endgame, right? Think mm. about, if you imagine that film is Thanos's film, then you realise that you've got a really complicated protagonist at the heart of it because Thanos is set up as the villain, but he is a complicated, compromised villain. He he believes what he is doing is right. He kind of has a point, and it's important for us as readers or viewers to always think that our antagonists have their own moral code and they are doing something that they think is right. And they may be going about it in a way that is slightly different to how we might go about it. And he's going to lose things along the way and he's going to make compromises along the way, but they will push him towards his singular vision. And that's what makes him an interesting villain because at some point you should be able to go, he kind of has a point, which then makes the film and the whole concept of good versus bad, good versus evil or you know right versus wrong, very interesting because maybe if Thanos had had a better teacher or a better mentor or a better parent, then maybe he wouldn't have gone about deleting half the universe. And if you apply that to writing about issues or writing about the way society is, like think about, think about what the emotional truth of what you're trying to write is. Think about the ways you can complicate those emotional truths and just think about not having people come at it from fixed positions And if they are coming at it from fixed positions, mess with those fixed positions as much as you can. What you don't want, what you want is for a character to go on a journey and come out the other side. And this is how Kurt Vonnegut described it. There's a really good lecture um, he does called The Shape of Stories, which you can find on YouTube. And he does one where he draws a curved line and he goes, man in a hole, man finds himself in a hole and gets gets himself out of the hole and finds himself better off for the experience. And I think that most stories have to have that thing. It's much more about the journey to the revelation or the journey towards the moment of discovery rather than the moment of discovery. It is that cliche of um, it's the friends we made along the way, you know? So when you're writing, 
when you're writing about political things, just think about the people who are at the heart of them. What is their position? How can you complicate things for them? What does this mean for them? What are the stakes for them? What do they stand to lose? What do they stand to gain? And what is, at, at their core, what is their central journey? You know, stories can be about anything. And, and also no one really wants to read story that is just your political point. If you're going to do that, just write a series of tweets rather than a, a, a book. So that I, I, I love that. And I think the book is uh, fantastic. But I do want to ask you about book marketing, which is always a challenge for authors. Now, you've got memoir, you've got YA fiction, you've got other books. How are you marketing this nonfiction book in a different way than marketing your other types of books? I think in terms of marketing, the important thing to remember is, and I've seen this firsthand, how little social media actually moves the dial in terms of sales. Sure, I can make a lot of noise on social media and go, here are some infographics that are quotes from the book and yay, you all know it's coming out. But like actually, it's got such a low conversion rate of sales and that's probably the only place where I have an audience but they're an audience who are sort of waiting for my angry tweets about politics rather than going I'm going to buy this guy's book so <laughs> um so yeah like uh Brown Baby my my parenting memoir came with a podcast and and a lot of that was just because um I'd had a lot of conversations with other parents along the way and a lot of things that I couldn't include in the book and I wanted to find a way of continuing those conversations but also platform other people's voices because the central question at the heart of that memoir was how do we find how do we raise our kids to be joyful in a world that feels bleak which is a thing that most parents think about and I wanted to find a way to give those parents a space to talk about it and then with your story matters so the it's actually the other way around with that so the substack was first so what happened was I got employed to run a creative writing course which I love doing it's, it's it's one of my favorite parts of the week but I have in the past been critical of like creative writing courses that have course fees and um, how the industry goes to those courses first to find exciting new debuts and it's not about the courses themselves but it's about how they're prioritized by literary agents and there is like a privilege in being able to afford to do what those courses and so I thought why well, I can just make my course notes free and so I started a a newsletter a substack newsletter where I was just pushing out my course notes for that week over the course of six months and it quickly gained a following and my editor for Brown Baby was like well why don't we just put this out as a book and I was like yeah and then she and I talked about, you know, you can't just like print, like take a bunch of Substack newsletters and go send this to the printing factory. Like we have to <laughs> work out what the sort of the unifying thing about it was. And like my editor, the amazing Carol Tomkinson, she was like, well, you've been a mentor and a teacher for so many writers over the years. And I have, like I've mentored a lot of writers who've gone on to like huge, huge things over the years and I was a youth worker for a really long time. I do lots of school talks. I do lots of university talks. I teach in school. I've taught for First Story. I've taught Arvon courses. I've taught workshops. I now teach at Faber Academy. And I've taught in so many different contexts. And they've all, but they've always had the same unifying thing, which is the starting point isn't how can I be a better writer? The starting point is your story matters and you have to tell it because if you don't, who will? And that became the kind of the unifying thing for the book. And so that's how that all came about. So, yeah, there are all these sort of add-on bits I do, but I am wary that, like, I think people place a lot of importance on having a social media profile, doing all these extra things. But actually, like, I do say in the book, I can't help you write a bestseller and I can't help you get published, but I can help you write the best story that you feel you can write. And I feel like I'm asked all the time by writers, like, should I get on Twitter? Should I have a social media profile? Should I like shout about issues to get noticed? And I'm just like, no, just write what you need to write. Like you don't have to have a profile because the writing will trump everything. You could have a million followers and be a rubbish writer and still get a book deal. <laughs> you know? But I'd much rather 
if you don't feel like things like Twitter or Instagram are natural places for you, then people will spot that and you won't build up the following you think will help you get published and you'll get frustrated and it'll take you away from the writing. And actually the only thing you can control is the writing. So just keep writing. That's fantastic. So where can people find you and your books online? On social media. (laughs) 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 Uh, I'm joking. Um, Basically, uh, I have a free uh, creative writing newsletter that you are more than welcome to sign up to, nickesh.substack.com, where I post up a weekly thing. I'm on Twitter and Instagram as myself, but I guess the main thing is like, for those of you who are writers who want a book, that might it's not going to help you get published it's not going to help you write a bestseller but it might just help you figure out what you're trying to say then your story matters is out and available wherever you feel most comfortable getting books be that library be that the dreaded a site or be that your local independent bookshop like i I make no judgment on where people buy their books because it so many people have different needs and different accessibility requirements and all the rest of it so wherever you feel most comfortable getting a book please do get it brilliant well thanks so much for your time Nikesh that was great thanks thanks for having me So I hope you found the interview with Nikesh useful and that it gave you some insights and thoughts for your own writing process I have another in between so coming up this week with Catherine Goldman on the legal side of NFTs and blockchain and what the implications might be for intellectual property licensing in this future world and the publishing contract clauses to avoid to future proof your author career. Then next Monday, I'll be talking to Monica Lionel about how to use Kickstarter for your book. And our interview is packed with ideas and I have lots of notes. <laughs> and yes, I am intending to do one in the next few months. Lots of opportunities for creators these days. So happy writing and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes and show notes available at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast. You can also get your free author blueprint at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. If you'd like to connect, you can tweet me at The Creative Pen or find me on Facebook at The Creative Pen. See you next time.